Science claims more than method. In fact, it claims to offer us a future hope. But in and of itself, science has no ethical boundaries. What are the values, if God and faith are to be excluded, that will actually measure the impact of science on human life? It's wrong to say that science has no ethical boundary. Science is based on telling the truth, which is a really important ethical boundary. It's one that I don't think religion shares, in fact. The point is that telling the truth and full disclosure, and also doubting yourself, being skeptical of, because the easiest person to fool is yourself. And I think all those values are, in fact, the very values we need for a better society. All those things, if any of those things were true in, in my country, in Washington, it would be a better place. And so I think that science can offer a better world. And in fact, a world that's more ethical, and to the extent that you talk about morality, then, then, then you can get from books written based on Iron, Iron Age peasants who, who didn't even know the Earth orbited the sun. I really think that, in fact, if you look at, at democracies and science, science has not flourished in countries that don't have democracies. And democracy can't function without the very things that science is based on, an informed public, an informed legislature who base public policy on empirical facts instead of ideology. The dialogue between science and religion has gone this way. It has been one of relentless and one directional erosion of religious authority. I, I would challenge anyone here to think of a question upon which we once had a scientific answer, however inadequate, but for which now the best answer is a religious one. Now you can think of an uncountable number of questions that run the other way, where, where we once had a religious answer, uh, and now the authority of religion has been battered and nullified by science and by moral progress and secular progress generally. And I think that's not an accident. Uh, and the, the one area where religion still seems to uh, hold its ground uh, is now under assault by science, and it's, it's very good that it is under assault by science. And this is the whole issue of morality and human happiness and what constitutes the good life. And let me just tell you why I think this is a scientific question. Even the place of science is ultimately a scientific question. Because surely there are objective facts to be learned about the basis of human happiness. The, the moment you recognize that morality and spirituality and, and, and value is a matter of, of happiness and suffering, and that we're moving suffering in the direction of happiness, then you, you realize that if there are objective facts to know about human happiness, and surely there are uh, facts about the way that genes and ideas and uses of attention and economic systems, social structures, all of these conspire to make us happy or miserable. It's true that, that scientific discourse is just in the beginning of addressing these issues, but it, it's not too soon to say that love is better than hate in terms of ethics. And we are, we are studying these things at the level of the brain. Eventually we will understand the brain basis of love and hate and the kinds of, of, of mechanisms, both cultural and, and personal, that ramify these states of mind. Uh, and there will be right and wrong answers. And we'll find, for instance, that honor killing is a bad strategy if you want to raise compassionate men. Uh, we know that already, but we'll, uh, at some point we will know this biochemically. If you think about why you might need God in order to be moral, I can only think of two reasons how that might come about. You might say you need a book to tell you what's moral. Well, as for that, I sincerely hope that nobody in this room bases their morals on the Christian Bible or the Quran. Because if they do, then their morals are likely to be hideous. Needless to say, you can find some decent verses. You can find some decent verses in both the Bible and the Quran. And if you pick and choose those verses, then you can say with hindsight, uh, this verse fits in with my view of what's moral, that verse doesn't, so I'm going to ignore that verse and choose this verse. But you didn't need the Bible in order to do that picking and choosing. You did the picking and choosing on the basis of something else, something which we all have in common, whether we are religious or not. We're all 
to a greater or lesser extent, moral, some of us more so than others, whether we're moral or not, has nothing to do with whether we read the Bible. Some people are kind, some people are sympathetic, some people care about suffering, other people don't. It has nothing to do with the Bible. The other reason why you might need religion in order to be moral is that you are either afraid of God, you're afraid if you're not moral you'll get punished, or you're trying to suck up to God and be good so that you'll get a reward. Neither of those two is a very noble reason to be good, to say the least. Now, uh, you, you might say that that forces me into a challenge. Um, how do I know what's moral? Well, I don't on the whole, but uh, the point I want to make is that there does seem to be a kind of universal human acceptance that certain things are right and other things are not. If you look cross-culturally, look at different, um, look at anthropological findings on different cultures, you'll find there's a kind of agreement that certain things are wrong and other things are right. The golden rule, do unto others what you would expect them to do to you. This is a very, very widespread principle and it, it almost amounts to common sense in, in, a, in a way. You certainly don't need a holy book in order to tell you to do that. Now, as an evolutionist, I think that it comes partly from our evolutionary past. I think that there was a time in our history when we lived in small kin groups, and we lived in small groups where good deeds could be expected to be reciprocated. And under those conditions, we developed a kind of lust to be good, which was parallel to the lust for sex, uh, which has obvious Darwinian advantages. Our, our evolutionary past built into us a lust for sex, and by the same token it built into us a lust to be good, a lust to be, to be friendly, a lust to cooperate, a lust to be sympathetic towards suffering. So I think it partly comes from that, but it also comes from something less easy to define but which, which is clearly there because I, I call it the shifting moral zeitgeist. It's something that changes from decade to decade. Living as we do in 2007, there will be a broad consensus of what's right and wrong. Racism is wrong, um, sexual discrimination is wrong, uh, cruelty is wrong, which characterize we who live in the early 21st century, which would not necessarily have characterized our ancestors 200 years ago. The consensus has moved on, and I find this a very interesting, fascinating fact, which suggests that there really is a kind of something in the air about what is regarded as moral. And it clearly has nothing to do with religion, because it doesn't come from scripture. Scripture hasn't, doesn't change over the decades in the way that our attitudes to slavery, our attitudes to women, etc., do. There really does seem to be a powerful, shifting zeitgeist effect, which is, doesn't tell you anything in itself, but which, it, it, which indicates that there is something in the air, some, some other force, something which we can understand with sufficient sociological, psychological sophistication. Whatever else it is, it's not religion. Why do we disagree? Trent is smart. He's a good person. I'm kind of smart. I'm a good person. We have this radical difference of opinion here. Why is that? Something seems to be wrong, doesn't it? Have you ever talked with believers? And you, what's wrong? Why don't you understand what I'm saying? And we, we think the other one is nuts or something. I think it has to do with how you choose to view human nature. If you view human nature as a top-down thing, that we are subservient, slaves, underneath some leader, authority, alpha male, well, then you're going to see the world totally different than if you flip the perspective and see it from a bottom-up thing. We are biological organisms in a natural universe where we are all free to think for ourselves. You get to choose whether you see yourself as a slave or a sheep needing some master, or if you view yourself like we did with the American Revolution, the first country in history to take a sovereign authority above us, the church, the monarch, and flip it upside down so that we, the people, bottom-up, so asking if there's no God, what is the purpose of life, is like asking if there's no master, whose slave will I be? Who's going to give me my orders? How am I going to know how to live? I mean, what a, what a submissive way. Worship is, is demeaning. Worship and glory is demeaning to who we are as human beings. You have a choice. 
If you will make a decision to flip your perspective, to stand up and open your eyes and see the world bottom up as it really is, using reason and kindness in place of superstition and faith and fear, and the world, I think, will be a much better place without that divisiveness and that delusion.